Thank you all for coming. I'm going to begin by telling you a story. The main character in this story is this guy called Ronald uh, Opus. And some of you might have heard of him because he died in very uh, interesting circumstances. So on March 23rd, according to the story, on March 23rd, 1994, there was a medical examiner who was looking at a body. And the body belonged to Ronald's, Ronald Opus. And he looked at the body, he concluded very, very quickly, it's very obvious, the guy died of a, a, head, a gunshot wound to the head. Right? Somebody fired a shotgun at him, at his head, and his, his head got blown off. So, pretty obvious, this is a homicide investigation. Right? Uh, f on further examination, the question, how did the guy end up getting shot in the head with a shotgun? Turns out he was about to commit suicide. He went to the, 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 top, the roof of a 10th floor, floor building and jumped down, jumped off the building. And on the way down, when, he's, when he reached the ninth floor, somebody fired a shotgun from, from inside through the window and blew his head off on his way down. So that's how he died. Hmm, very strange. So now it's a, yeah, it's, 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 you can't make back your mind whether it's suicide or homicide, right? because he could die anyway. So is it suicide or homicide? Not sure. Ah, but something, something interesting happened. It turns out that there is a safety net on the eighth floor. And the reason there's a safety net is because they are doing window, window cleaning that week, so the safety net is there to protect the workers. Therefore, if Ronald Opus hasn't been shot on the way down, he would have survived. So it's, it's murder. Okay, then the question, like what happened? Like who, who fired the shot? So the police investigated that. Turns out on the ninth floor, there lived an old couple, old man and an old woman. And the old man was taking the sh aiming the, the shotgun at the old woman, his wife, and pulled the trigger and he missed. And instead of shooting the wife, he shot through the window and shot Ron Opus on his way down. So now it's murder. So because if you're trying to murder one person and end up killing another person, it's still murder, correct? Okay, so the murder investigation again. So they went to, they went to uh, interview him. Uh, turns out not so simple. What happened was, it turns out, uh, the, this old couple, they, they fight all the time. And every time they fight, same pattern. Like the old man would take a, the shotgun and threaten the old lady, and they both know the gun is never loaded. And all the neighbors testify, they do this all the time. Right? It's, there's no intention of killing anybody. Okay. So now it just became an accident investigation because somebody accidentally loaded the shotgun. Who loaded the shotgun? And according to the investigation, some neighbor was an eyewitness, he saw the son of this couple secretly loading the shotgun. Why? Turns out because the son is like a drug addict, gambling addict and so on, he has been financially dependent on his parents, didn't do any work, and one, one fine day, his mother just got fed up and stopped supporting him. So cut off, his financial, cut off her financial support of him. And he got so angry, he wanted to kill his mom. And the way he was going to kill his mom, because he knew this thing happens all the time, he secretly loaded the shotgun so that the, the, the father will pull the trigger at the mom and the mom will get shot. That's, that's his plan. Good. It's now back to murder. <laughs> So what happened to this, this like, what happened to the son? Turns out uh, he, he had this plan to kill his mom for six weeks. For, for some strange reason, the couple did not fight. And this son, he was so, his, he was so uh, uh, what you call depressed that his mom didn't die and he has no money. He was so depressed, he went to the, the roof of the, of the 10th floor building and jumped down. And on, on his way down, his head got shot. <laughs> And his name was Ronald Opus. <laughs> so the case was ruled by investigator, investigators as a suicide case close. <laughs> the, yes, the title of this story is Karma in Action. <laughs> so by the way, this story didn't actually happen. It was told by this guy called Don Harper Mills, who when he told this story, he, wa he was the president of the Academy of Forensic Sciences uh, in America. And, and he told this story as an illustration of the intricacies of his job as, as a forensic investigator. And then it went viral. 
like people posted it on the internet as if it's a real story, and it just yeah became very big. But it's an interesting story. The reason I told this story is that when we think of karma, this is what we think of. We think of stories like this, right? You do one thing to hurt somebody, you get hurt yourself. You know, something like that. Specifically, the word karma itself literally means action, to act, to do. That is karma, and in Buddhism. It specifically means action that arises from intention, and the Pali word is satana, sometimes translated as volition, which is the same thing, right? Intention, volition, and this action, because it arises our intention, karma creates an imprint in the mind. So when one performs a wholesome, sorry, a deed out of wholesome intentions, for example, if we do something out of generosity, our kindness, our compassion, our non-attachment, then the wholesome intention uh, comes from the mind, correct? And because it comes from the mind, having done the deed, the intention leaves a residue, and the residue uh, stays in the mind as an imprint. And in this case, you have the imprint of good karma. And the opposite is true, right? If you have an intention that arises out of an unwholesome intent, sorry, action arising out of unwholesome intention, again, because of intention, it leaves a residue, and the residue is karma. The first effect of karma is disposition. So, if a person performs a deed out of anger, for example. His mind will be imprinted with the experience and the intention of anger. And what that does is, if you do something out of anger, then you strengthen the neural pathways in the brain that is conducive to, to anger. Therefore, next time in a similar situation, you are more likely to become angry, right? Because the neural pathways have been strengthened. Right? Makes sense, right? And the more you do that, the more neural pathways are strengthened, and therefore. Eventually, if you do this often enough, you become that person. You become a angry person in this case. So, in this sense, the imprint, the mental imprint, reinforces a sort of mental habit that creates a, sorry, that causes a person's mind to react in a certain predisposed way. In other words, intention causes mental habit. Mental habit causes disposition. And this position becomes character; it becomes you, which is the first way karma changes you. That's one. There's another effect which is related to the first one, which is and maybe more important than the first one, which is karma affects the way uh, karma affects a person by affecting his experience. Which again, at first, it sounds a little bit strange, but look at it this way: our experience, our feeling of joy, our feeling of suffering, and so on, come mainly from the input, right? The stimulus, sensual input, and at least as importantly, maybe more important, our reaction to the input. So, taking the angry guy for example, or in other words, another way to see it is. Whatever we perceive, we perceive through a lens, and that lens, to some large degree, determines our experience of the event. So again, taking this angry guy as our example. So in many situations, now that he's because he has created a karma of anger, he often feels uh, uh, angry, right?、Uh, he feels a pain of anger. He has very little peace, and then in every situation that for most people like、eh, nothing lah. To him, he said, "Oh my God, I'm so angry. This makes me so mad." Right? The disposition, the imprint, affects his experience. And if what happens if he, this person,、uh, because he comes to my class, he takes such insight yourself, he learns meditation, and then he develops his mind, and he develops, let's say, peace and love in his mind. So he's, he's a different、uh, mental inclination. If he does that. He could live the exactly the same life all over again, have exactly the same input stream, and his experience is different, because now his input stream is is perceived through a lens of peace and kindness and love. So changing the lens 
changes experience, even though the input is the same. And that is one of the effects of karma, by creating the mental imprint that changes how you perceive experience. And therefore, in, a sense, in that sense at least, that is how karma causes suffering. If, even without a spiritual explanation, just neurologically or, or psychologically, you can understand the effect of karma on suffering or happiness. So that's the second, second way karma affects uh, your life. There's a third way that karma affects you, and this one is speculative. It is speculative because the first two ways you can understand through uh, daily life. The third one sort of requires you to die. And so that's why, yeah, you, usually things that require you to die is harder to prove. And the third way karma affects you is rebirth. For those of you who believe that thing, right? So, so for those who, some of you are Buddhists, you might, you might believe this, that, that if you die, uh, when one is dying, another is born. And in the, birth, in the death and the birth, there is a continuation. So that's rebirth. Notice I didn't say you die and you're reborn. I didn't say you. I said and when, when one dies, another is born, and there's a continuation. And there's, there's subtleties in there, and we can talk about this in detail if you have questions. However, the question then is, how does, how does this relate to karma? If we think of karma only as mental imprint, how does this, like, how does this affect this process? Uh, the explanation I've heard, the one that I think most appeals to me is this, is that the last moment of your death, of this life, the very last moment, determines the next life. Therefore, if the very last moment of your life, all that is in your mind is greed, hatred, anger, jealousy, affliction, then you have no choice. And, and therefore, the next rebirth very likely will be something that you don't want. However, the, if the reverse, if at the moment you die, your mind is full of love, or full of peace, or full of compassion, glorious, open, uh, uh, positive states, then at the moment of death, according to this theory, you have choice. Right? And because you have choice, most likely you'll choose a higher rebirth as a god or as another human being, uh, maybe born in Singapore where things are kind of nice. Right? Or, or if you are a better person than that, if you are like uh, Di Zhang Wang, uh, you, go, you go to hell by choice. Right? And the reason why they go to hell is that he said, if I don't go, who goes? Right? Somebody has to save those beings, and he, he chooses to go. So, so not, not necessarily the karma will bring you a higher rebirth. What the good karma does, it gives you choice. And with the choice, sometimes the, higher, the most highly attained beings choose a lower rebirth in order to benefit those beings. So this is a third way karma affects you. First, by uh, uh, mental, dis mental disposition, by affecting your experience, and possibly, speculatively, by affecting your rebirth. Make sense? Okay. So this talk is not about karma. This talk is about how to change your karma. Uh, first thing is, if you have good karma, don't, don't have to change. <laughs> so it's not about change. Yeah, I, I was, that's funny. I was at, at Sibelo, right? the Quan, Quan Yin Miao, the, the Quan Yin Temple at Sibelo, and there's like Zuan Yin Si, and the guy tried to sell me, hey, you have Zuan Yin? I said, well, Yin Chi is so good, I don't Zuan Yin. He said, my luck is so good, why do I need to change my luck? Right? So anyway, this is not about changing. This is about upgrading, upgrading your karma. How to get karma 2.0? <laughs> Three ways. Uh, first way is to increase your good karma. Second way is to undo the bad karma. And the third way is even better, to become immune to karma. Or if you like to think of this way, think of it as first one, try to win, or try to break even, or to quit the game. <laughs> Either way, you don't lose. Right? There are only three ways to not lose. Right? Win, break even, quit the game. So you have, you have complete set right here. Given that karma is intention, how do you create more good karma? Very easy. Just do a lot of deeds with good intentions. So, so that's the basic. I mean, the moment I say is, is, is you can figure it out. So lots of actions through body, speech, and mind that is motivated by wholesome intentions. That is all. 
Uh, that's the good news. So what's the bad news? There's no bad news. There's good news and better news. Now with me, there's no bad news. That's why people love me, <laughs> besides my good looks and, and my, wife's, my nice white suit, which is very hot. <laughs> I mean, like physically hot. <laughs> there is a very simple one-word solution to creating good karma. And the one word is dana, D-A-N-A, dana. And dana means generosity. That's it. Dana, generosity, uh, this, this, there's something called the 10 parameters, the 10 perfections. Anybody who strives to, to uh, uh, become a bodhisattva, to become a, a person of, who's perfect in wisdom and compassion for the benefit of all sanctioned beings, anybody who strives to become that person has to gain perfection in all 10 paramet parameters. And the first parameter is Dana. And there's even stronger statement made by a, a master, who, unfortunately, I don't remember who it is, and I couldn't find a reference anymore. And if you know, please let me know after this. And this master says, the, the one, the only important parameter is the first one, is dana. The other nine, they're all commentaries on the first one. Okay, so the other nine are just details on how to, be, how, to do, how to practice dana. Is that important? And later on, I'll give you a, 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 one illustration on how that works. Dana is so important that in the teachings of the Buddha, uh, Dana is given, is treated as a foundation and as a seed of spiritual development. Right? And according to uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, he says that when the Buddha gives a lecture, he, if he goes to a village for the first time and the, the give a lecture to people he hasn't spoken to, the first thing he talks about is Dana generosity. And then after he talks about Nana, then he talks about other things. He talks about uh, morality, sila, uh, uh, karma, uh, practice, the Four Noble Truths, and so on. But before all that, he always talks about Dana first. Is that important? Because that's a foundation. So generosity. It is a huge topic, by the way. So I did some research before I did Kiri's talk. Turns out it's a very big topic. Turns out I can give a whole speech on this topic alone. Uh, however, happily, a lot of it is very straightforward. A lot of it is, are things that even I could figure out. Right? For example, I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, giving with the right intention, of course. Right? Don't give the wrong intention. Uh, uh, give in a way that don't make the recipient feel bad. Right? And things like that. You all understand that. So I'm just going to give you a few points which I thought are very important and uh, I, that stand out to me about, about this topic of dana. The first point about dana is please feel free to feel good about yourself if you practice dana. Like if you're giving to a charity, feel free to, yeah, I just give to charity. Wow, very good. Huh? Like feel free to feel good. And the Buddha puts it this way. The Buddha says, a noble giver is one who is happy in three circumstances. He's happy before, during, and after giving. Right, so uh, let's see. Before he gives, he's happy anticipating the opportunity to practice dana. During the giving, he is happy that he's making a fulfillment, I mean, he's fulfilling somebody else's need. And after he gives, he's satisfied that he's done, he's done a good deed. So feel free to feel good. And in fact, I think feeling good is actually a spiritual practice because it encourages, it plants a seed for future goodness and also inspires other people. Because if you feel good about doing good, it, it sort of shows, shows in your face, shows in the way you act, you carry yourself. And people look at you and say, hey, I want to be like that guy. Why is he always so happy? Because he's generous. I want to be like him. Right? So that's the first thing. Uh, feel free to be happy. The second thing about dana, uh, also important, is dana is not just about material gifts. It's not just about giving money or stuff of food is also about beautiful words and beautiful thoughts. Right? So saying something nice, that is dana. Sometimes not saying, not just saying something nice, saying something maybe not so nice, but however our intention of helping other people, that is dana. Uh, beautiful thoughts, right? If you look at a human being, your first thought, if you think, I wish for this person to be happy, just that thought. That's dana. Don't have to do anything, don't have to say anything. Just think. Just thinking is dana. Right? Thinking, I wish for this person to be free from suffering. That is dana. So, so in addition to gifts, 
body, speech, and mind. Any act that arises from the generos generosity of body, speech, and mind, that's dana. Do it. It's good, for, it's good for karma, and as, as usual, rejoice in it, if you want to, if you can. Your own virtue, sila, your virtue is itself dana. And the Buddha put it this way. I, I found this amazing, by the way. Uh, he said, by practicing virtue, one gives the gift of fearlessness, fearlessness love, and benevolence to others. So, for example, if, if you are very nice to people, if you are virtuous, one of, one of the things that happen is that people have no fear of you. Right? When they are with you, they feel very safe. Right? Because they know this guy is not going to hurt me. He's so nice. So that is a gift of fearlessness. And the other things are gift of love, gift of affection. So those are all dana. And here you can see, what is the second parameter? The second parameter is sila, perfection in morality, in ethics, in virtue. And you can see here that the perfection in virtue is actually a practice of dana, which is why, therefore, the other nine parameters are mostly, uh, uh, mostly what do you call that, uh, details on how to practice dana. So dana is that important. Last two things about dana. One, uh, really important. What is the greatest gift of all? In Buddhism, and I think it's true, uh, generally, the greatest gift is the gift of Dharma. And Dharma here, I do not define as necessarily as a teaching of Buddha. Dharma here is defined as universal law, specifically the type of teachings that help people be happy and be free from suffering. Whatever the religion is, whatever the culture context, any teaching that helps people liberate from suffering and learn to be happy, or the way I'll put it, inner peace, inner happiness, compassion. That is the greatest dana of all. So the way to do that is to practice the dharma, right? Become a better person beyond, beyond perfection in your virtue, also perfection in your practice, your meditative practice, your loving kindness practice, and then use that as a vehicle for teaching dharma. And that is the greatest of all generosity. So that's dana. Oh, one other point, really, really important. It's important because this point is not emphasized enough, I think, which is the Buddha says there are five, there are five skillful ways to give. And the last one is this, give without hurt to self or others. Without hurt to self or others. In other words, don't give to the extent that hurts yourself. Because if you do that, there's not... There's no productivity. Right? It's, just actually, it's just a transfer. Which raises an important, interesting question, right? Because if I'm a selfish person, then if I give to the extent that I don't hurt myself, I never give anything, right? So it, sort of, it sounds like it interferes with generosity. However, uh, my, my own experience is that the more spiritually developed you are over time, the more your capacity is, the more you can give without hurting yourself. Like for example, if, if, you, if you learn to become more generous, then over time you learn to, you learn to like grasp onto less and less money. So the additional dollar you give away hurts you less than before. And as time goes on, as the practice goes on, your capacity for giving without hurting self becomes stronger. So trust in that process. So trust in the process. Give as much as, as you're comfortable giving and trust that as you grow spiritually, you will increase. So important, don't hurt yourself during giving. So that's the first, the first way to upgrade your karma, do uh, uh, in, in, increase good karma. The second way to upgrade your karma is to undo bad karma, which is interesting, right? The, the, the fact that you can undo bad karma. How do you do that? Again, back to the first definition. Karma is intention. Given that, the way to undo bad karma is with compensatory, compensatory intention. Creating new intentions that compensates for the unwholesome intention you just had. How do you do that? The best way I know of, okay, the Tibetan way to do that. 
is something called purification of karma. And uh, it's done with something called the Vajra Sattva practice. And the best way, to, the best description of, of that practice comes from this guy called Lama Zopa Rinpoche, who is a teacher of, of uh, Venerable Sangye Khadro, who is supposed to speak about this topic today. So I'm, I'm fairly sure what I'm going to say, Venerable Sangye Khadro will not object. I hope. Well, otherwise, I'll back karma. I, mean. <laughs> I need to do a lot of clarific clarification. <laughs> anyway, uh, Lama Zopa recommends 10 steps. And it's, it's a bit onerous, but I'll tell you what they are, and I'll give you, I'll give you a, a framework so it's easy to remember. The first step is taking refuge. So for those of you who, who, uh, who are Buddhists, take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. Or if you're like me, I take four refuges. Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, and air conditioning. <laughs> Especially when wearing a suit. <laughs> the reason for that is humility. So by taking refuge, straight away, you reduce your own ego. Right? Straight away, not just reduce ego, something else happened, which is by doing that, it also increases, increases uh, uh, the, the perception of interdependence. Right? So what that means basically is the reminder, the world doesn't revolve around me. I am not the most important person in the world. Right? So that's the first effect, take refuge and in humility, uh, uh, interdependence. That's the first step. The second step is regret. Right? If I created something out of unwholesome karma, I just, I just wanted to kill somebody. Very bad, very bad for my intention. Very bad intention. Regret. I, this is bad. Right? So remind myself why this is bad. And then discourage myself. Don't do that. Boy, not good. Right? Don't kill anybody. Okay? So, so that's the second step, regretting. Regretting, by the way, doesn't mean beating yourself up. Right? It means there's, there's, a, there's an element of, of love in there as well. And, and the best way to do that is something called the grandmother mind. And, and pretend you have a loving grandmother. Right? From the point of view of your loving grandmother, you are perfect just as you are. Your grandmother loves you whatever the circumstance, and sometimes she scolds you for your own good. Right? So, so, and when she scolds you, it's our love. There's, there's an there's a affection there even when she gives you scolding. And so, when practicing regret, that is the right mind to use. To become your own loving grandmother, self-reflect and say, boy, not good. Okay? Okay. Make sense? Okay. So that's the second point, regret. The third one is to remember impermanence and death. Remember, someday I'm going to die. The reason to do that is if you remember that you're going to die, straight away, half the motivation of the unwholesome intention goes away, straight away. For example, if I'm going to embezzle $10 million right, from, from the thing who or whatever, if I remember this thing, someday I'm going to die, half the reason for embezzlement goes away. Why want to, why want to need $10 million? I'm going to die someday. Maybe right? you take, right? take more. Yeah, maybe I take 100, yeah, 100 million maybe. <laughs> well, this guy uh, teach me to be bad. Uh. <laughs> But, but you see the point, right? The point is, a lot of times we do a lot of bad things because we, we don't remember that we do die someday. We live as if we live forever. And the moment we remember, someday I might die, suddenly something changes. Suddenly you say, wait, that thing, not worth it. Right? Even, even if you don't believe in religion, you say, on the grand scheme of things, not worth doing this. So that takes at least half the power away from bad intentions straight away. The fourth thing is, oh, this one is very powerful. The fourth thing is uh, bodhicitta, generating bodhicitta. In other words, this is a step where you realize, or you at least create the intention that by undoing the bad karma, it's not just for yourself. It is for the benefits of all sentient beings. Right? I just did this, I just had this unwholesome intention action. I want to undo it so that I can benefit other beings. So you bring in an element of selflessness, altruism, into this process. And again, straight away you can see, right, this, this compensates for the whole unwholesome intention. Uh, what else? Uh, okay, the next few things are a little bit tricky. Uh, a little bit tricky because uh, you sort of have to believe this to, to practice it, but you don't have to. But I tell you what they are, you're free to, to say, nah, that doesn't work for me. The next step is visualization. 
And specifically, this means to visualize uh, the, the deity Vrajayan, Vrajasattva, uh, in both the male and female form, the, the father form and the mother form, uh, on top of the head, so on and so forth. Uh, the step after that, again, optional, is to uh, recite the mantra, the mantra of Vrajasattva. The mantra has 100 uh, syllable, syllables. And basically, it boils down to, please make me unsuck myself. Okay. That's the basic idea. Yeah, you praise brother, but please, I, I, I really suck, please unsuck me. You know, that's, that's a rough, but not in those exact words, by the way. <laughs> that's my interpretation. However, if you want a short version, there's a three-word version. The three-word version is Om, Vajrasattva, Om. That's all. Om, Vajrasattva, Om. If, it, if that works for you. If it doesn't work for you, ignore this. The step after that, again, requires you to believe in this stuff, and if you don't, it's optional, is generating the faith that your karma has just been purified. And in fact, if you think about it, it's not doesn't require that much faith, right? Because if you understand the psychology of what we just went through, you already, yeah, most of the karma has been undone already because you just created humility, you just created altruism, and you just regretted what you did, and so on and so forth. Right? So, even psychologically alone, neurologically maybe, you undone the bad, the bad imprint. And if you believe in the spirituality of it, then this is the stage where you have full faith. Ah, my karma is gone. Woo! Okay, if you want to do that. Uh, the next step is the reframe. Reframe from doing this again. Not just from doing this, reframe from creating negative karma in general. So a re reaffirmation of your own power to do good. Uh, last two, okay, next one, again, uh, on, on that, that side of, you need to believe it, is uh, something called absorption. And I can see how this works. Absorption is when you don't just imagine the Vajrasattva, you imagine Vajrasattva being you, absorbed into you. And if you believe in this stuff, I think this is quite powerful, psychologically. Because psychologically, there is a saying, uh, fake, it fake it until you, you make it. Right? One very valid way of practice is actually faking it. For example, I didn't know how to become a confident person. However, though the way I did it was I pretend that I'm already confident. I come on stage pretending I'm a confident person. And by doing that, eventually I become that person. And today you will watch me speak, right? This, I, I seem very confident. It's through that practice. Faking it until you make it. And at first I told it as a joke, right? But it turns out in Tibetan Buddhism, there's actually a valid practice. And one of the valid practices is to pretend you are a bodhisattva. If you don't know how to be, you don't know how to be perfect in compassion, it's okay. You pretend you're already perfect in compassion. Then eventually you become that person. So in this case, is by absorption, you pretend you're already perfect, in, in at least a sense. Your, your karma is perfect. You're a good person. Then eventually, you become that person. So in a way, it's creating a mental habit, mental habit of goodness. And finally, this one again, important. Finally, uh, dedication. The dedication is that the good karma I just created for myself, whatever did I, I did in this process that is good for me, I want to use it for the benefit of all sentient beings. And this is a very common uh, practice in Tibetan Buddhism, and I highly encourage this. So it's like if you, you do your, your, your one hour of meditation, the merit doesn't go to you. It goes to the, the, whole, the whole universe. Or at least you think, you aspire for all this to, to go to the whole universe. Um, so that's it, 10 steps. Basically, uh, what we just talked about. Basically, creating humility, uh, interdependence, regret, and then creating uh, altruism and all the other good factors to compensate for the negative, unwholesome men mental imprint that you just created. Shall I go through the 10 steps again in brief? Okay. First step, uh, taking refuge. Second step, regretting. Third step, remembering uh, impermanence and death. Fourth, bodhicitta. Fifth, visualize. 
Six, uh, the mantra, Om Vajrasattva Home. Seven, generating faith, faith that my karma has just been purified. Eight, uh, reframing from creating negative karma again. Nine, absorption. And 10 is dedication. 10 steps, 10 easy steps. My guess is if you do any one of those steps, it's pretty good. If you do two or three, I think you're more or less covered. So just remember this too, yeah. I mean, for, for me, my, my first thing, I take refuge. I, every time I have evil thing, I take refuge, and then I do, regret, I, I do a regretting, and I do the bodhicitta. Bodhi bodhi so I, I think for me, that sort of covers it. The rest, I'm too lazy to do. <laughs> so that's step two. Remember the, the three steps? Try to win, try to break even, and the last one is try to quit the game. So the third step, uh, the third way to, to uh, in upgrade your karma is to become immune to karma. Or at least bad karma. I mean, good karma, maybe you, you don't do immune. At least bad karma, to be immune. How do you do that? In Buddhism, there's only one known way to become immune to karma, which is, anybody knows? To become fully enlightened. Okay? To become a Buddha or an Arahant. Once you, once you achieve that, you're fully immune to karma vipaka. At least, at, at least that goes a the theory. Okay, so that's the good news. What's the bad news? Again, no bad news, correct. Only better news. Good news and better news. The good news is that there's a way out. There's a way to be immune to karma. The better news is that you don't have to be all the way there. It's prorated. <laughs> if you're 10% enlightened, 10% right? towards enlightenment, Already, you have 10% fewer afflictive thoughts. So if you create 10% less karma, good, less bad karma, and you have 10% more uh, affectionate, loving, peaceful thoughts. So you have 10% good karma, more good karma. So it's prorated. So any step of the way that you make on this progress, on, on this, on this uh, journey, is progress. It benefits you. Ananda made a very interesting uh, ins observation about enlightened people. And, he, and by the way, I mean, remembering that he's with the Buddha all the time, right? he's seen a lot of things. He says that everybody who has been enlightened that he knows about came to enlightenment from one of four approaches, and there are only four. The first one is to begin with serenity and then end with insight. And the practice of serenity, of course, is, uh, is shamatha, which is calming the mind. And the practice of insight is vipassana, which is observing in the mind and creating insight. And I'll talk a bit about that later. So start with, start with uh, serenity and with insight. That's the first path. The second path, second approach is the reverse. Start with insight and with serenity. The third approach, Ananda say, is do both at once. Practice both serenity and insight and let them strengthen each other and grow together. The fourth way to become enlightened this one is very interesting. Ananda says is, this is when the disciple's mind is, is seized by the agitation of Dharma. The disciple's mind is seized by the agitation of Dharma. And Ananda says this without explanation, assuming everybody knows what he's saying. And I have a theory. So th for those of you who have attended my talks before, uh, every time I say I have a theory, it means I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just making stuff up. I almost say the S word, but that's making stuff up. <laughs> and most likely it's BS, but I'll tell you my theory. My theory is, okay, first part, the part is not theory, the part that I know for sure, is that meditative practice, all of meditative practice, all my 22 years as a, as a meditator can be summarized in two words, and the two words are letting go. All of meditation is about learning to let go. Letting go of, at first, of gross, gross evils. Right? Uh, intention to kill, intention to steal, sexual misconduct, and so on. And then following by subtle and subtle things, and ending with letting go of self. And then letting go of being, and letting go of non-being, and so on and so forth. So it's all about letting go. Given that, my theory is that for, specific, for some very small number of people, they found a way to spontaneously let go to the degree that achieve enlightenment. 
And one of the examples uh, is this guy called Eckhart Tolle. Anybody here knows or heard of Eckhart Tolle? He wrote a book called The Power of Now. And he describes his enlightenment experience as, as this. He was, he was very, very depressed. He was a uh, suicider. He was very close to killing himself. And then one fine day in his room, suddenly everything changed. Everything in the room looks different. And he had, that was his enlightenment experience. Just suddenly all changes. And so I, when I met Eckhart Tolle, I, asked him, I, gave him, I told him this theory. I, I asked him, was that what you experienced? Right? Did you spontaneously let go of everything, including self? And he said, yeah, that sounds about right. So that's the fourth way. Uh, in other words, of the approaches to enlightenment, to nirvana, the only reliable way is a combination of serenity and insight. And there is a third way. There is another way that doesn't require serenity and insight, and insight but it's not reliable. It doesn't always happen, and, and it's dangerous, because if, if you need to be depressed to get there, sometimes you sort of die. <laughs> you sort of kill yourself first. So don't do that. Do the other three approaches. Serenity and insight in either, uh, in any one of the, uh, what do you call that, uh, or in any order. So, how to do this, right? Uh, or rather, what, what are, the, what, how to do this and how does, how does mastery look like? Are you interested to know? Okay, let me give you some, some example. Uh, so, serenity. Serenity, the, the practice is shamatha. Shamatha is when, remember the first exercise we did earlier before the talk began, we settled the mind. So that practice done to mastery. Right? So you are able to settle the mind on demand. You are able to calm the mind down on demand. And there are various grades of, of this. The first grade is that you do this in a way that is useful for work. Right? If in an office, if everybody in the meeting room is present because there's a crisis going on at work, and everybody is, is panicking, and you alone have the ability to calm the mind. Your ability can think. I mean, you alone can think. Then, next promotion cycle, guess who gets considered? Like, it's you. Like, because everyone looks at you, and they think you're a leader. So, so that's one of the first steps. Like, the ability to calm the mind on demand in a way that is visible to other people, that allows you to think, that is useful for work. So that's one. However, it gets more. It gets better. As various grades of shamatha in deepens, as you deepen in shamatha, one of the, one of the things you do, uh, early, again, one of the early achievements, is the ability to bring attention to one object continuously, non-stop. For example, the breath. So bring attention to the breath and never losing attention to the breath. But it's not exclusive. So, so there are, you also sense other things, distractors, thoughts, sounds, and so on, but you never lose attention to the breath. So that's one of the early achievements. And the next one is your attention is exclusive to the breath. And not just you don't lose attention, you don't, you don't sense anything else, and so on and so forth. And you get to the stage where you get into the jhanas. And the first jhana, according to the description, is when your mind is so concentrated on one object, which in this case, again, the breath, the mind has no movement away from the breath at all. It just stays there, perfectly still. And in that mind, you are fully concentrated, you are relaxed, you are vivid, and you are, you are relaxed so that at the end of 24, and you can do this for 24 hours at a stretch, by the way. And after 24 hours of intense concentration, you come out of it and say, ah, now I'm relaxed, now I can do real work. Okay, so intense concentration, very restful. Uh, and then there are five factors called the jhanic factors arising. The first two are perfection in, consent, in attentional factors. Vipaka, sorry, uh, vitaka and vichara. The ability to move attention, the ability to stay attention becomes perfect. Joy factors, piti and sukha. Uh, energetic joy, non-energetic joy become perfect. And the last, the last one is uh, uh, one-pointedness of mind. So you achieve perfection in all this, and this is only the first jhana, and it goes on. So, so if you go on the samatha path, this is where you lead to. Profound peace, profound happiness. Happiness which is independent of sense experience. In other words, there's no more incentive to do anything evil from that point on. It's fascinating stuff. So that's the first path. 
uh, the, first, the first way. The second one, uh, seren- uh, insight. Uh, insight, the practice is vipassana, which is very simply observing yourself. And through observing yourself, gaining insights in at least three processes. The process of emotion, the process of cognition, and the process of self. So knowing deeply how you feel, how you think, and your being. And in doing that, uh, one of the end goals, again, not, not the complete perfection, the master, one of the mastery points is arriving at the point of no self. Arriving at a point Again, there are two flavors. The first flavor is when you find that there is only the observer and the observer has no identity. There's only the observer left. Identity is completely let go of. That's the first flavor. The second flavor is there is no observer. There's only the observation. And once you reach there, again, freedom, liberation, liberty. So that's uh, that path, mastery. The mastery of, okay, there's a third path. Very important. So I talk about serenity, I talk about insight. There is something else, which is uh, the heart practices, the Brahma Viharas. Loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, equanimity. In the Pali Sutras, in the traditional, uh, the, the original teachings of the Buddha, those things they were talked about, but they were not separated out. And the assumption, and I asked, I asked this to Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, why is this the case? And Bhikkhu Bodhi says, because in, the, in that tradition, it is assumed that implicitly, if you practice serenity and wisdom, all these hard practices will just strengthen by themselves. They are embedded in. And to me, one of the biggest contributions of Mahayana Buddhism is separating it out and elevating it to something even higher than the, the others. And the highest of this is compassion. So three ways. Uh, first is, rem- remember what they are? Generating good karma through generosity. Second is becoming, uh, sorry, be- uh, undoing bad karma through the Vajra, Vajra Sattva practice, but through purification. And third is to become immune to karma by working towards enlightenment. Okay. Let me end with a story and a confession. So let me tell you the story first. The story is how I became a Buddhist. And I'll tell you the relevance in a minute. I became a Buddhist in 1991 in September. And it uh, actually happened over there, that, that room over there. Uh, what was the, what's the place called? Uh, Dharma Hall, yes, in the Dharma Hall. And what happened was, I, I came to, to listen to a talk by this lady called Venerable Sangye Kadro. And before, just before the talk, uh, we, had time to, we had time to chat, so I went to Venerable Sangye Kadro, and I asked her the question, which in retrospect is a bit rude, but I asked her the question, what is it in your Buddhism that addresses suffering? And Venerable Sangye Kadro says, all of Buddhism is about addressing suffering. And I had my, oh my gods moment. Yeah, I'm, poly, I'm polytheist, which is like, oh my gods, you know. Like, oh my gods. In that moment, I knew I was this close to what I was seeking. Whatever it was. Whatever it was I was seeking, I knew I was this close. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know how to get there. I didn't know how I know, how I knew. All I knew was I was this close, and all I needed was one tiny step to find what I was looking for. So that was in that hole. And then the week after that, I met the same woman, uh, Venerable Sangye Kado again. And this time she came to NTU and she gave a talk and I was in the audience and I didn't ask her any question. I was sitting in the audience and in the middle of a talk, he, she, she, she mentioned one sentence. She said, it's all about cultivating the mind. It's all about cultivating the mind. And there and then I had my mini Kensho experience. And the way I describe to myself is, suddenly I understood everything. Everything in my life suddenly made sense. And there and then, at that moment, I decided, from this moment on, right here, right now, I'm a Buddhist. And I never turned back. So in a sense, uh, San- Sangye Kado was my first, my, my first Dharma teacher. She was the woman who made me a Buddhist. So I owe her. 
which is why about a week ago, I was having lunch with a bunch of uh, Buddhist leaders. One of them came uh, at that table, one of them just came in and said, uh, that's bad news. We were like, what? And he said, oh, Venerable Sangke Kado is in hospital. It's pretty bad. And, and worse, she has, she has classes in Singapore. And can some of you take, take, uh, no, uh, take over some of the classes? And I happen to, my, my only availability is today. Because after, after that, I'm, I'm going back to California. And so uh, I was asked, can you do this class on the 20, 28th or whatever day it is? I was like, yeah, whatever. If Venerable Sangke Kado needs me, I'm there, whatever it is. I didn't ask the topic, by the way. I just said yes. <laughs> I was like, how hard can it be, right? By the way, the most dangerous question in, in the world, how hard can it be? I said, how hard can it be? Okay, I'll do it. What's the topic? And then I found out the topic's on karma. I said, oh. <laughs> Turns out, uh, by the way, so my, here's my confession. My confession is I came here uh, at first agreeing to do this, not knowing what the topic was, and it gets worse. This topic is way beyond my core competence. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so at first I was a little bit worried. I was worried that, that I didn't have, I mean, every, I just told you everything I knew about karma, by the way. And I, I was worried that it wouldn't take more than five minutes. Five minutes and then it's all over. <laughs> That's all I know, sorry, go back. <laughs> and then I thought, it's not the worst thing in the world, right? Because if that happens, what happens? You all get an early day off and you can spend time with your boyfriend, but don't let your husband know. <laughs> just kidding. So, uh, Given that this topic is not my core competence, I hope, I hope that my talk hasn't been a complete waste of time. Okay. And, and if it is, uh, you can ask for a refund from, from Victor. Yeah, yeah he, he won't give you a refund, but you can ask. <laughs> and I hope that the, you will practice these three things. Generosity, uh, purification, and meditation of insight, serenity, and heart practices. And through doing any of those things, I hope that your karma will improve. I hope that you enjoy plenty of karma for the rest of your life. Plenty of good karma for the rest of your life. And with that, thank you very much. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, Ming Su Xiong. Uh, my name is Arthur. Yeah? Yeah. I've got a few questions here. The first question is about karmic hindrance here. Yeah? Karmic hindrance. Yeah. Then number two is about um, the right teacher. The right teacher. Mm -hmm. And then number three is about action. Uh, firstly, about the karmic hindrance. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for people who encounter uh, difficulties in life, for someone like myself previously, I thought it was my feng shui, my la, I go and ask to pay kong kuan yin. Then I thought it was karmic hindrance. So please share with me about karmic hindrance itself. Mm -hmm. Then number two is about the right teacher. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Myself, for the last two or three years, I have been running around like a headless kitchen looking for the right teacher. Mm. So I'm not too sure uh, what, what is considered a right teacher in, in pursuing the Dharma path. Yeah? Mm. And then lastly, it's about actions. Yeah? About uh, daily, some small actions like killing an insect, seeing a cockroach in my kitchen, I killed it. Mm. What has got to do with karma? Yeah? Mm. So these are my three question, related questions. Yeah? Okay. I'll answer the third one first. Uh, uh, because because it uh, is is the most I mean to most to me the most practical one, and also the hardest one. Uh, the question is about killing cockroaches right, or other insects, and so on. Uh, that one is very tricky. I mean, so so I I've heard uh, by the way I I've asked around I asked various teachers uh, I heard three there are three responses and I tell you what what they are and I tell you my own feeling my own response. The first and and the three responses there's some there's some uh, what the word conflict between them so they're not. They're not entirely compatible. The first one is, is an obvious one. Of course, it's bad karma. It's killing, the right? <laughs> okay, fair enough. So cockroach and whatever, you kill them, it's bad karma. That's, a, that's the first answer I got. The second one is, is a bit weird. And it's not compatible, the first answer. The second answer is that if you kill an animal with quote unquote lo the, lower, the lower rebirths, I mean the lower births, insects, uh, uh, fish, and so on, then you're giving them an opportunity for a higher rebirth. So you're doing them a favor. <laughs> All right. All right, okay. Sounds a little bit like rationalization. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, yeah, recycle the karma, right? Yeah, this talk is made 100% recycle, recycle karma only, right? <laughs> 
So uh, yeah, doesn't doesn't write me the right way. Uh, both, by the way, both don't write, don't write, don't write me the right way. The first one sounds a little bit fundamentalist. The second one sounds a bit uh, uh, what's the word rationalization. The third one uh, makes most sense to me. The third one actually came from Sangeet Khadra. And and what she said is uh, bring first thing bring awareness to the imperfect imperfection of this world, which is that for us to survive, some animals have to die, even if you are vegetarians, even if you don't kill a single ant, because to to even the practice of agriculture requires the killing of animals, right? insects and birds mostly. So for you to eat, some animal died for that cannot be avoided. Therefore, given that, the, the, question is, the question then is what to do. And Venerable Sanke Kado said, therefore, the best way to do that is to every time you eat or every time you, you are responsible for an, another, another animal dying, commit to not letting that life go to waste. So commit to using this, your own life, for the benefit of all sentient beings. So commit to a practice, commit to, to uh, uh, compassion, Commit to coming to Kwang Ming Sung and give talks when they ask you to, you know, things like that. <laughs> so b- benefiting others. So uh, I think that's the best answer. Uh, my own, my own uh, uh, feeling is that uh, that is the answer. And, and there's something else more than that, which is I started thinking about this. And I think the question I ask myself is why? Why am I killing spiders? Why am I killing cockroaches? And the answer is fear. Right? I'm killing all those creep, creepy crawlies because they are creepy. Uh, because I, there's a fear. There's a fear that if I don't kill this spider, at night it's going to bite me and I'm going to die or something. Or it's going to be very nasty. Or the, the cockroach is going to uh, contaminate my food and so on and so forth. So it's all about fear. And that fear to me is not entirely baseless. Right? So there's, there's justification. However, so it seems to me that what is even more productive than, than speculating on karma is to attack, address the fear. Why am I fearful? And is, is there anything I can do about it? And I think there is. And I think what is, I can do is practice. Practice of the three pillars, serenity, insight, and love and kindness. So uh, that's the third question. Uh, uh, second question is on teacher, finding the right teacher. Who is the right teacher? Uh, my, my suggestion is for you to shop around. Shop around uh, and don't don't uh, don't be exclusive yet. Yeah, sort of have 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 some kind of uh, re- have a relationship with a teacher, but not exclusive. Um, the reason is that every teacher has a bias. Uh, every teacher has uh, has strengths and limitations, uh, and they may or may not work for you. Uh, let me see. Are there examples? So, okay, so there's one example, a couple of examples. Uh, uh, if you go to a teacher with, maybe I, I tell you about a, a really good teacher I have, and then we come back to this. A really good teacher I had was uh, this guy called Mr. Godwin. Godwin, he just passed away. And, and one of his insights, which I, which I heard, which I admire a lot, is, is his ability to, to uh, adjust his teachings to his audience. And the Buddha does that a lot, right? but Mr. Godwin does that as well. And the way he puts it is quite funny. He said when he goes to America and teach, he will tell, he will tell Americans, don't work so hard, don't work so hard, relax. <laughs> and then when he's teaching in Sri Lanka, he'll say, don't relax, work hard. <laughs> <laughs> because they have different cultural inclinations. And given that, if there will be teachers who are inclined one way or the other, and sometimes they don't necessarily know the bias. So, for example, the teacher who is type A personality, very tense, this person will find, will find the, the approach of relax, relax, uh, non-thinking mind, letting go, the non-profit mind, so on and so forth, uh, uh, or sitting with our agenda, just sit. you find that very appealing. And when he teaches, he's going to have that, that bias. He's going to say, okay, everybody sit with no agenda. Just sit. And then you just two hours, just said, right? that's it, that's the entire instruction, just sit. Works for some people, doesn't work for others. And then there are teachers on the other spectrum. Right? Teacher go on a stick and say, work harder. Right? And so depending on your orientation, either one may or may not work for you. And then there are teachers who explain it to you. And so, and I think they're they kind of rare. And they're rare for a reason. I, I discovered this. 
I discovered that uh, to, to get into a certain state of, that, that, that is described in the scriptures, certain state of, let's say, shamatha, is very hard. And it's even harder in a, that to explain is even harder. To get to a state and then to verbalize how you, like, verbalize what the state feels like is even harder than, than getting there. To figure out how you got there is even harder than that. So, so my experience and the experience of a lot of, of meditators, usually you just sit. And then suddenly you say, woof, you're in, you in some state of shamatha. So how did I get here? No idea. Last, last hour, just, I was struggling. Last hour, I was going to give up, give up. Suddenly I'm here. And then the next time you do it, no struggle, but you never get to the state. Why? It makes no sense. Right? It's very hard to figure it out. And then once you figure it out, it's very hard to explain to others how to get there. And even if you can do that, it's very hard to get help people individually. Therefore, it takes true genius to be a, a great teacher to everybody. And therefore, I think the Buddha is the greatest genius who ever lived in, in this world, ever. The greatest of all geniuses. And, and the implication of that is that it's not just, you don't just want to find a good teacher, you want to find one that's, that fits you. Because not all good teachers will fit you. So that's why I say shop around. Right? And even the good teachers shop around, uh, have a skept skeptical, respectful but skeptical. Uh, and, and respectful and even knowing that this guy is a good teacher, it's amazing and may not fit me. Not, not his fault, not my fault. No fit. So having that mindset. Uh, the, question, the, last, the first question was karmic in hindrances. Uh, I'm going to say I have no idea. It sounds like an imponderable to me. So it's, it's one of those places where uh, yeah, only it takes a Buddha to figure it out. And the Buddha actually says something very interesting about this. Uh, it's in the script, I don't remember which sutra. It's one of those uh, uh, sutras that is, that's fairly famous. And the Buddha was explaining, he said, there are people, how should I say it? Um, he said there are people who are bad now and the next life Oh, okay. So there are people who are spiritually, spiritually very strong and they can see people's past life, one past life and one future life. And when they see that, they get confused. Why? Because they look at this guy's past, uh, uh, past life and say, past life, this guy did so many bad things. But this life, he's, he's so happy, he's living in luxury. Like he's had a good rebirth. And then, this other person, past life, she's a good person. This life, she's living in luxury. She's a good rebirth. And then on the flip side, right, that person, past life, a uh, good person, this life, bad rebirth, and so on. All combinations are there. So, and so the Buddha said, anybody who can only see one rebirth will come to a wrong conclusion because you'll see all these confusing signs. And the Buddha said the only explanation is if you have to see multiple rebirths all the way back to see that there are things that they've done in like many, many lifetimes ago that is coming to fruition now. Right? And it takes, it takes a Buddha to see this which is why anybody who is less than the Buddha will get confused. So therefore, uh, it's hard to say, it's hard to speculate on this, on karmic hindrances. And I, I think my standard answer, which is uh, just do what we talked about today. Create more good karma, undo your bad karma, and work towards enlightenment. Uh, the first question is you as a Buddhist, you, do you believe that the evil exists? Do you believe that the, there's an existence of people with full bad karma? First, second question. Uh, even if you work hard on staying stable with your good karma, right, and purifying yourself, how do you protect yourself of people with bad karma and bad intentions? Mm -hmm. I mean, we touched that already last uh, weekend a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. But so I'm really wondering if you can manage it in a way that you always wish uh, this person to be happy, even so he's evil and all that stuff. I mean, like, if mm. you, for me, I'm still struggling with that point, I must say that. Mm. So I okay. wonder how do you do that. Okay. Uh, let me answer the second question first, because it's, it's shorter. The uh, second question, if I remember correctly, is protecting yourself from bad people. Yes, do this all the time. Right? Uh, and I mentioned it in last week's class. If, you, if one person is committing something, doing something bad to another person, if you stop that, you're you are saving two people. You're saving the victim and the perpetrator. Because if the perpetrator commits the evil act, this person creates bad karma for himself or herself. 
which is why I don't let anybody take advantage of me. Even though I'm practicing compassion and generosity and so on, if I let somebody take advantage of me, I'm, creating, I'm allowing them to create their own bad karma. So it is for me an act of compassion to stop, to protect myself. It's a compassion towards them. So uh, I, think, I think that was the answer. Uh, that could be the full answer, which is why like in, even in, in monasteries, right, which is why uh, martial arts develop in monasteries. Martial arts have to put, the monasteries have to protect themselves. Right? Uh, does that answer it or is there more? Ah, evil. Evil. Oh, this is, this is fascinating. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to tell you a story again. Uh, so the, the question behind the story is that are we born good or are we born evil? Right? And I recently saw a, a research on TV I, that blew my mind. So there are two experiments. The first part didn't blow my mind. The second part blew my mind. And I, let me describe what, what it was. Hmm. So the experiment was done on, on babies, very young babies. Uh, babies cannot, cannot talk, right? So you cannot ask them whether they're good or evil. Right? So, so to experiment on babies, you need to be very skillful. So I thought the experimental design was, was, was ingenious. So the design was uh, you have a puppet. So there's a puppet show, the baby's watching. And this puppet, and then there's, like, there's a box of uh, candy. So there's this puppet trying to open the box of candy. Okay? And then the two other puppets, a good, quote, a good puppet and a bad puppet, helper and hinderer. So this comes, and then the hinderer tries to stop the first puppet from opening the box. And then the helper tries to help this puppet. So they're all puppets, by the way. Right? So the question, which puppet does the baby prefer, the helper or the hinderer? The baby always prefer the helper. Right? So, so there's a root, the root of goodness is already there. Because in, intrinsically, uh, what's the word? In, instinctively, you prefer others who help other people. Okay, the second part, not surprising, the second part blew my mind. The second part was, uh, this time, before this experiment, now we have two puppets. Puppet A and puppet B. And uh, so you give, you give the baby a choice of two, two candy. And the baby choose one of the two candy. So this, I prefer this, the baby prefer this, doesn't prefer this. And then you have two puppets, puppet A and puppet B. Puppet A, prefers the, can, the same candy as, puppet, as a baby, puppet B doesn't prefer the same candy. Puppet B prefers the other candy, the other choice that he didn't choose. Okay, so now puppet B, who doesn't prefer the same candy, is in this situation. Right? Try to open the box of candy, helped by one and hindered by the other. Which one does the baby prefer? The baby prefer the hinderer. Right? So this puppet, I mean, I just, let me just say that again. This puppet doesn't share the same preference of candy as a baby, and the baby prefers the puppet that hinders this puppet. In other words, the roots of evil already there, right? I mean, it's not like not helping, it's like hindering. I want to hurt this puppet who's not like me, and it's purely based on the choice of candy. That alone makes me want to hurt this puppet. It's mind-blowing, right? I mean, to us, like, when we, we think about this, the word we use is, is evil. One thing to hurt somebody because it's not like you, that's evil. It's already there. So, are we good or are we evil? We are both. 